वाहेगुरु जी का खालसा वाहेगुरु जी की फतेह सासंग जी आप गुरुदास साहिब चला दे अते एकता दे एकता दे ला ते होर सोसाइटी दे नाम रल के कई विचार चर्चा शुरू कर लिए आज साडा पहला चर्चा विचार है साडे पास आप पहुंचे हैं स्किन स्पेशलिस्ट डॉक्टर प्रिया कौरिया गुरुदास साहिब कला मंडल अते सांस अंतर मनु डॉक्टर साहब जीआई नो आते हैं ते नाम भी उसके साथ ही बीबी हरमंत को जीआई नो कहते हैं सांस अंतर जी डॉक्टर ने आज सदा शरीर के चमड़ी अते किस तरह की आदत ना है ये विषय है आज योग्य की एंडोकिन आते हैं इस तो बाद आमवान बच्चों इस तो बाद इस तो बाद स्वाल जो आप होंगे ये संकल्� Dr. Mr. Krivan, Pantali Mink, Dr. Priya, is it for 45 minutes yet? How many of you? Oh, hey, which are the people who are going to be able to get the first time, which are the ones who are going to be able to get the first time, which are the ones who are going to be able to get the first time. Why do you think that? 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 सारे क्लब विच काफी सेक्शंस हैं कि नहीं एक मेडिकल ग्राफ है तो उन्होंने विच डॉक्टर प्रिया थे और काफी डॉक्टर लेक्चर्स देने ने ऐसे मेडिकल चेक भी करते हैं पर आज सारे को काफी डॉक्टर देने नहीं सी सो इस करके मेडिकल चेक एस वाले नहीं ऐसे कर सकेंगे पर जी वाले जो ग्रुप कराएंगे मेडिकल चेक एम ना ऐसे को डॉक्� शुगर ते हाइट वेट नाने के डॉक्टर को नुकसान ये भी तो नो मेडिकल चेकअप 
ਕਰਨਾ ਪਊਗਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਫਾਰਮਾਸਿਸਟ ਹਾਂ ਮੈਂ ਦਵਾਈਆਂ ਦਾ ਪੜਾਈ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਫਿਰ ਮੈਂ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਦੱਸੂਗੀ ਵੀ ਤੁਹਾਡੀਆਂ ਦਵਾਈਆਂ ਕਿਵੇਂ ਰੱਖਣੀਆਂ ਕਿਵੇਂ ਲੈਣੀਆਂ ਪਰ ਅੱਜ ਉਹ ਉਹ ਟੌਪਿਕ ਹੈ ਹਾਂਜੀ ਅਗਲੀ ਵਾਰੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਜ਼ਰੂਰ ਆਵਾਂਗੇ ਆ ਅੱਜ ਤਾਂ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਪ੍ਰਿਆ ਨੇ ਅੱਜ ਤੁਹਾਡੀ ਚਮੜੀ ਵਾਲੇ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਨੀ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਦੱਸਣਗੇ ਵੀ ਇਹ ਸਕਿਨ ਕਮੀ ਆਪਾਂ ਰੱਖਣੀ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਜਵਾਬ ਸਾ ਕੁਐਸਚਨਸ ਪੁੱਛ ਸਕਦੇ ਹੋ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਪ੍ਰਿਆ ਸਕਿਨ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲਿਸਟ ਨੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਜਿਆਦਾ ਪੜਾਈ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਸਕਿਨ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਔਰ ਮੇਰਾ ਸਾਰਾ ਪਰਿਵਾਰ ਇਹਦੇ ਕੋਲ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਨੇ ਜਦੋਂ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਸਕਿਨ ਪ੍ਰੋਬਲਮ ਹੋਵੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਵਧੀਆ ਨਾਮ ਕਿਆ ਰੱਖਦੇ ਨੇ ਆ ਇਹ ਐਸ ਵੈਲੀ ਦੋ ਹਸਪੀਟਲ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਦੇ ਨੇ ਇੱਥੇ ਮੈਂ ਮਨੀਪਾਲ ਹਸਪੀਟਲ ਹੈਗਾ ਨਾ ਕਲਾਮ ਉੱਥੇ ਕਰਦੇ ਨੇ ਨਾਲੇ ਕੋਲੰਬੀਆ ਏਸ਼ੀਆ ਬਤਾਲਿੰਗ ਜਾਇਆ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਦੇ ਨੇ ਸੋ ਜੇ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਸਕਿਨ ਦੀ ਕੋਈ ਲੋੜ ਪ੍ਰੋਬਲਮ ਹੈ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਪ੍ਰਿਆ ਨੂੰ ਪੁੱਛ ਸਕਦੇ ਨਾਲੇ ਉਹ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਕਾਰਡ ਦੇ ਦੇਣਗੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਆ ਕੇ ਅੱਜ ਇੱਥੇ ਉਹ ਵੇਖ ਨਹੀਂ ਸਕਦੇ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਕੋਲ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਇਨਸਟਰੂਮੈਂਟਸ ਹੈ ਨਹੀਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਮੈਗਨੀਫਾਈਂਗ ਗਲਾਸ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਸਕ੍ਰੀਪਿੰਗ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਕਾਫੀਆਂ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਚਾਹੀਦੀਆਂ ਸੋ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਮਿਲ ਸਕਦੇ ਪਰ ਇਸ ਵੇਲੇ ਮੈਂ ਪਾਸ ਕਰੂੰਗੀ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਪ੍ਰਿਆ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਇਸ ਟਾਕ ਦੇਣ ਲਈ ਵਾਇਬ੍ਰੇਟਿਕ ਦਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਇਬ੍ਰੇਟਿਕ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਅਸਰੀਕਾ ਵਾਇਬ੍ਰੇਟਿਕ ਦਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਇਬ੍ਰੇਟਿਕ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ thank you very much for having me here today to talk about the skin my name is priya and i am a skin specialist a dermatologist uh, mainly based here in klang in manipal hospital i think i may have seen some of you before some of you look familiar but anyway i'm very happy to be here and um, i'm going to talk to you about your skin and how to look after your skin i want this to be a very interactive session please so please I'll ask you questions, you answer my questions and we'll talk to each other. It's not going to be I'm giving you a lecture, I don't mind that. It should be fun, right? Okay, so my topic is your skin and looking after it. So first question, we're going to ask some questions. First I ask you questions and after the talk you can ask me questions. Okay, okay so what is the largest organ in the human body? Don't answer it. Let me give you some multiple choice. Is it your heart? Is it your lungs? Is it your kidneys? or is it your skin? skin? Yes, it is the skin. The skin is the largest organ in the human body, but this is something not many of us are aware of. And this is the structure of the skin. This is the top layer. This is what we see when we look at our skin. What is this that I'm showing you here? Hair. Yeah, this is your hair. So this is the top layer of the skin. This is the second layer of the skin here. And what is this yellow part? Fats. Fats. So that's what makes us all different. We, each of us have a different layer of fat. Some, some of us have thicker layers and some of us have thinner layers of fat. Okay? And do we need our skin? Is our skin important? Yes. yes. The skin actually has many, many functions. So these are all the functions of the skin and we will go through them one by one. The first thing that the skin does is it protects you. If anything wants to come and attack you, the topmost layer of your body is your skin. So the skin serves as protection. It is also for fluid balance. What do I mean by fluid balance? Anyone can tell me? Sweating. Sweating, exactly. So sweating and it, water evaporates from us when it's hot and uh, when it's cold that we preserve heat. Okay, so the skin is involved in fluid balance. Temperature control and fluid balance are almost the same in terms of what the skin does. So you know that if you go from a hot place to a cold place, what happens? You, you feel cold and you can feel that your hair is all standing up, correct? So what happens when your hair stand up, stands up? It traps air and the air will keep you warm. And when you go from a cold place to a hot place, what happens? You start sweating. So when the water evaporates from your skin, it cools your skin down. So that's how your skin maintains your fluid balance and also your temperature. Sensation, we know we can feel pain, we can feel um, itch, we can feel all sorts of things on our skin as an organ of sensation. This is also a very, very important function of your skin where it produces vitamin D. 
vitamin D is produced in the skin. So you would be interested or surprised to know that in Malaysia, there is a lot of vitamin D deficiency because we actually avoid going into the sun. It's too hot. So your skin will produce vitamin C when you go out into the sun. But we try not to do that so much. We try to stay indoors because it's too hot. So there's a very high rate of vitamin D deficiency in Malaysia. And why is vitamin D important? For your health of your bones, to maintain healthy skin, healthy hair, and it also protects against many types of cancer. So vitamin D is important. Now, immunoregulatory means that your skin also serves as an organ of your immune system. And now it's a very interesting question also. So far, I've given this talk in many places, in quite a few good words. Nobody ever gets this correct. How many types of skin diseases are there? Can anybody take a guess? And just give me a number. Think about this. How many types of skin diseases are there? Yes, yeah, psoriasis is one of them, but that's only one. How many types? How many types? If I tell you that my skin textbook is this thick, how many types of skin diseases do you think are there? Thousands, millions? Well, not millions, no. <laughs> and not 2.6 billion, I don't know, okay? okay. More than 3,000 types of skin diseases, all right? More than 3,000 types. That's a lot, yes. That's why skin specialists are needed, because there's so many types of skin diseases. And how many percent of us have a skin problem? How many percent of the population have a skin problem? No, in general. Eighteen? That's a very fair, fair guess, about 20 to 30 percent. Yeah, 20 to 30 percent of us have one sort of skin problem or another going on. Okay, the next question is, how many percent are seriously affected by their problem? How many percent are seriously affected? So we know that about 20 percent of us have a skin problem. Angie? So out of the 20 percent of us, how many of us are seriously affected by the problem? Ten percent. Ten percent are seriously affected. And how many go and consult a doctor? Next question. How many percent of those with a skin problem actually go and see a doctor? Less than five percent. Fifteen percent. So you'd be surprised, huh? If you have a pain in your chest, you run to the doctor straight away, correct? Yeah. If you have a bad headache, you run to the doctor straight away. But a lot of times when it comes to skin problems, people will say, ah, that day is not important. I have other bigger problems. Why should I go and see a skin specialist? So, you know, very, very few actually go and see a doctor. So now I'm going to discuss with you some of the common skin problems. So when I say common, it means, you know, that I see in my clinic almost every day, right? I'm a bit sad that there's very few gentlemen sitting here and listening to this talk because skin is not something only ladies should be interested in. Okay, maybe they will come as time goes by. Okay, so what are some common skin diseases? Has anybody heard of this problem called eczema? Yes. Okay, eczema is the commonest skin problem and what happens in eczema? Go back, it is a chronic problem. Meaning that there's no cure. Sure, please, please go ahead and take pictures. But there are some uh, slides that I would definitely suggest you take pictures of and I will tell you which are the important slides as well. But you're welcome to take. It's a chronic problem which means that there is no cure. When you see a doctor and we give you medication, it's to control your problem so that you have a good quality of life. So the skin is very dry, it's itchy, it's inflamed and there are many, many types of eczema. I've been a skin specialist now for about 10 years and when I learned, when I was studying skin, we had about 17 or 18. Now there are more than 25 types that have been discovered. So medicine is very dynamic, it's changing everything. So there are many, many types of eczema. This is the commonest type of eczema that you see in children. It's called atopic eczema, where the skin problem affects the folds of the skin. So this is behind the knee. 
This here is at the elbow. You can't see very clearly, unfortunately. Um, this is on the back and this is the skin of a child. You can see around the eyes it's very dry, the forehead is also dry and the child looks very miserable. Why doesn't he? Because the skin is inflamed, it's itchy, it's very uncomfortable. The next type of eczema is called hand and feet eczema. This is also very common. And look at the hands here. You can imagine if your hands are like this, how uncomfortable you'll be. It's red, it's itchy, it's dry. Here it happens at the feet. Whole area of the palm is affected and here on the feet again. So this is again, this is actually a very common problem in housewives. Women after the age of 40 or 50, a lot of them have this problem because they've been touching all sorts of chemicals when they're doing their housework. Dishwashing liquid, um, Clorox, detergents, etc. Okay, so from now, if any one of you is doing housework without wearing gloves, please remember this picture and start wearing gloves when you do the housework. Then you don't have to come and see me. Okay, the next type of eczema is called seborrheic dermatitis. What is seborrheic dermatitis? Most of you do not know, but if I say dandruff, have any of you heard of dandruff? No. Yeah, dandruff is a type of skin disease. It's actually a type of eczema that's called seborrheic dermatitis. So it can affect, this is the scalp. This is, this is also the scalp without hair, of course, to show you. And look at this um, patient here with the redness around the eyes and the mouth. So this is also a type of eczema. It's called seborrheic dermatitis. And the next problem, which some of you have mentioned earlier, very common, the second most common skin disease, psoriasis. Psoriasis affects 3% of the world. So in Malaysia, what's our population now? Maybe around 35,000? So almost a million, huh? 30 million. 30 million, sorry, 30 million. So 3% of that, 900,000 almost? So almost a million people in Malaysia have psoriasis, 3%, 3%. And this is a disease of the immune system. The cells of your skin grow too fast so they reach the surface before they have matured. That is why they are thick, they are uncomfortable, red, um, and also can bleed easily. Psoriasis can also affect the nails and the joints. So has anybody, I'm sure you have seen somebody that you know, who has this problem. It's very, very common. Thick red scales can affect the scalp, the body. This is around the knees and the elbows. Very common skin issue. Next is acne. What's another word for acne? Pimples. Now, a lot of the times, people don't realize that this is actually a skin problem and it can be cured. Many skin problems cannot be cured, but acne can be cured. It can be cured and it's a wonderful problem to treat because the person who's suffering from acne becomes so much happier, has more confidence, quality of life goes up when the problem is settled. So acne can be cured. This is a patient with very mild acne. So at this stage, usually they will go to the pharmacy and buy Oxy-5 and Oxy-10 and this and that. You know? And if it doesn't get better, I usually see patients at this stage when it becomes moderate. However, if it's like this, this is considered severe acne, so you can imagine how painful and uncomfortable this person must be really having that type of skin. So acne is another skin problem, it's very common, especially in young adults. But surprisingly, for your information, in your 40s, in women, you can get a second round of acne as well. So those of you who are in your 40s, watch out, you might get acne, alright? Those of you who pass 40 to 50 plus, you're safe. No acne means no acne, okay? Sorry? 60. 60, forget it, don't worry. You're not going to you get other problems, you won't get acne. Don't worry. And don't have to worry about acne. Maybe some other things you have to worry about. Okay, next is urticaria. Okay, very common. Almost all of us will have this at some point in our lives. It is also known as hives. Okay, hives, it appears very suddenly itchy, 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 you know, all these bumps on your skin. It could be caused by allergy, but most of the time, we do not know what causes it. It's very common. Okay, these are all, what I'm showing you here are severe cases. So in very severe cases, you can even get swelling of the eyes. You know? So this is very, very, very itchy. 
This is a common problem again. Um, pigment problems. Pigment problems means anybody can tell me what I mean by pigment problem. Sorry? Color of the skin, yes. Pigment means pigment is the color of your skin. So pigment problems are problems that affect the color of your skin. Either your skin will become darker or your skin will become lighter. Right? So here, these are common pigment problems in women. This here is a sunspot. We call it an antigen. So those those of us who have been exposed to the sun without wearing sunblock in your 30s and 40s, you may start developing this type of a problem which we call a lentigen. The photo on the right hand side is a different type of pigmentation. It's very, it's not so well defined. Very, very vague, you know, but you can see the color of the skin is different. This usually happens after childbirth. Okay? This usually happens after childbirth. So the skin becomes darker. Here, the skin has become lighter. Why? This is a patient of mine when I was working in uh, Hospital Kuala Lumpur. This lady had used a whitening cream. And look at how white she became. Alright, so it's bleached. Very, not that common, but nowadays, you know, for some reason, people are obsessed with fairness, especially in Klang. I have to tell you, to share my experience after coming to work in Klang. A lot of Indian patients, Punjabi patients, they are using a whitening products, fair and lovely, glow, skin white, royal expert. These are the three most people of Indian origin are using. Not in uh, PJ and not in KL. The patients in uh, PJ and KL, somehow they don't use these things. But in Clan, there's a little bit more of an obsession about whitening products. So just be aware. You know, we should be happy with what God has given us. We shouldn't want to become fairer. Honestly, that's my opinion. Especially if it's going to harm your skin like this. And this is the most famous person in the world who had a skin problem that made him whiter and whiter and whiter. This is Michael Jackson. So he had a genuine problem. You can see areas here, white. This is a skin problem called vitiligo. And this affects about 1% of the population where the skin loses the pigment. So in order to compensate for the areas of his skin that had become white, he underwent the treatment to bleach his entire body. So that's why when he died, you can see he's all white. Okay, but he had a genuine skin problem. All right, Michael Jackson. Next, we talk about infections. Skin infections could be either bacteria, viruses, or fungus. So we'll talk about each of them. So bacterial infection occurs in children. This is called impetigo. It's a very common skin infection. And this is in adult. Viruses. Okay, can anybody tell me what this problem is called? Where it only affects half of your, half your body? It's called shingles. It's caused by a virus in the same family as the chicken pox virus. So this is a problem called shingles or herpes zoster is the medical term. And this is a common virus also in children especially. Those who go swimming, the virus likes to live in swimming pool areas. This is called molluscum. And this is another common problem, warts. All this, as long as it's an infection, it can be cured. So don't worry, yes madam. Shingles can start anywhere. Any nerve can be affected. It actually is a viral infection of the nerve. So it depends on which nerve is affected. Commonly, you're right. Commonly, it does occur on the back or the trunk. And fungus. Okay, okay, this is very, very common. Fungus can affect the area in between your toes. It can affect your scalp. And of course, very, very commonly, your nails can be affected by fungal infection. So if all of us look at our nails, I promise you, there may be about 30 of us here, so each person has 10 nails, so 30 times 10, there'll be 300 nails to look at just in this hall. And definitely one of those 300 nails will be affected by fungus. Okay? Definitely. That is that common. Scars. Scars are another problem in skin that people come to look at, come and look uh, for us. Okay, so where's, what happened to this patient? What was... She developed a scar after what? BCG infection, okay? This gentleman here, what operation did he have on his chest after which he developed a scar? Bypass, exactly. And this patient here, trauma. Alright, just after gardening. 
These are growths on the skin. These are called skin tags. They are very, very harmless. Again, all of us, if we look at our skin, we're going to find some of this. It could either be like this, or a darker patch like this, or many, many small ones on the face, or these little fleshy little growths here. These are all skin tags, absolutely harmless. This is not harmless. These are the types of skin cancer. Many types of skin cancer. I'm not going to tell you all the names of the skin cancer, but this one right here, here and here can be cured, but this one is called melanoma and that is very, very um, grave if you get this problem. Okay, so now I've shared with you a little bit about the common skin problem. So what should you do if you have a skin problem? Like I've told you, most of skin problems, they're not dangerous, all right, except, except skin cancers. So always see your doctor early because you want to get advice, treatment, prevention, and can also teach you about maintenance maintenance of good skin health, and you want to avoid long-term complications like scars. Skin problems are not going to kill you for the most part, but they can leave you with complications like scarring, like pigmentation, infection, embarrassment. So here you get scarring, untreated acne can give bad scars, pigmentation, infection, and of course, loss of self-confidence, loss of quality of life. So now, this part may be a little bit more interesting to the ladies. We talk about growing older. I'm not going to say growing old. Growing older. As we, everything in us ages as, we, as the clock ticks. And the skin does too. So aging is becoming inevitable. We cannot prevent it. We can expect, uh, we expect it, we fear it, and hopefully at some point in time we learn to accept it. So this is that naughty boy who's running around behind there when he was just a baby, the first decade of life, my son. You can see in the first decade, he had perfect skin. There's no blemishes, there's no wrinkles, there's no pigmentation. Perfect skin. So we always say baby soft skin, baby smooth skin, this is why. Okay, then in the third decade of life, this is um, me in my third decade of life, long, long time ago. This is considered the peak of beauty. The skin is flawless. Yeah, the hair looks good. And then, fourth decade of life, the changes have begun. So I put up this picture here just to share with you. If you can't see it very clearly, um, you compare Asian skin and Caucasian skin. So it ages differently. Who do you think is older in this picture? My friend or me? Which one of us is older? Sorry? My friend and I are the same age actually, but she does look older because Caucasian skin tends to age faster. In Asian skin and Indian skin, we are protected because we have higher amount of pigment. So it actually protects our skin from aging. And in the sixth and seventh decade, you can see visible changes. This is my mummy. Mm. Visible changes have already occurred. And in the eighth de decade of life, we cannot change what has happened already. So please don't wait until you're 70 plus or 80 plus to come and see me. I won't be able to do much. Right? So in the eighth decade of life, you've got decrease in everything. Collagen, elastin, the fat, the muscle, everything has shrunk. So there's nothing much that can be done. Right? So what happens as the skin grows older? So you can see a lady here in her 30s. 20s rather, 50s and then 70s. Huh? What happens is the skin becomes thinner, wrinkles start to occur, the skin sags, there's dryness, there's yellowish, yellowness, pigmentation and your hair of course becomes grey. So I want to talk a little bit about what happens, what makes us grow older, what ages us. Of course we have two types of ageing, what we call intrinsic and what we call extrinsic. Intrinsic we cannot change. It's happening here. As I'm talking to you, as you're listening to me, all of us are aging because it's dependent on time, it depends on your genes, and you can't stop it. So if you look at your parents, you look at your family members, you see how they have aged, you can expect to age like that. <coughs> Nothing we can do about intrinsic aging. Extrinsic aging, however, is how the environment and our circumstances, what surrounds us, contributes to us aging. So, environmental influence like ultraviolet radiation, UV light is coming from the sun. The more sun exposure you have, the more your skin will get damaged and it will age. 
cigarette smoking, poor eating habits, poor diet, exposure to irritants, to wind, to heat, all this can age our skin faster. And we can only control the extrinsic part. We can't control the intrinsic part. Alright? Okay, so this is somebody, this is a patient of mine actually. This is intrinsic aging. She sat in her house most of her life, didn't do that much of work outdoors. So you can see, and this is a farmer in Ireland where I studied, and she was a potato farmer, so she spent a lot of her life outdoors. So you can see the two women who are the same age, but one is much older than the other because one has a higher contribution of extrinsic aging. Okay, so now this part is important. So we've talked about the skin, we've talked about some skin problems. Now let's talk about how can we keep our skin healthy? Alright, what can we do? Of course, most importantly, it all comes down to your diet. Eat a healthy and balanced diet. Less sugar, fat and salt, grains, vegetables, fruits. Very, very important. It's not just for your skin, it's for anything. For your heart, for your uh, gut health, for anything. Eat a healthy and well-balanced diet. So if you want to take a picture, this is a very important slide. Okay, I would encourage you to take a picture. These are the superfoods for the skin. And for those of you who are vegetarian, you've got many, many choices here as well. Healthy skin foods. I think in Punjabi diet, we are very lucky because we do eat a lot of badams, uh, almonds. Almonds are fantastic for the skin. Fantastic. Okay, badam. So this is important for you to understand green vegetables, almonds, avocados, blueberries, any sort of berry, strawberries, blackberries, and salmon is representative of all the oily fish. Oily fish is also very good. And water, of course, drink plenty of water. So this is an important slide. These are the superfoods for the skin. Vitamin C, have a diet rich in vitamin C because vitamin C protects you against damaged by what we call free radicals. Free radicals damage your skin. Vitamin C protects you against that. And it also helps in the production of collagen. I'm sure you've heard of this word collagen. Collagen is a tissue in the second layer of our skin, which maintains our skin looking plump and healthy. Once we lose collagen, our skin starts to sag. Vitamin E works together with vitamin C. So you can get vitamin E in nuts, in tofu, in green vegetables and in avocado. They work together, together to protect your skin. Carotenoids, anything that is colourful. So you have your gajal here, your katu, your oranges, sun, you know, tomato and olive oil. Anything that is colourful has got beta carotene and lycophenol, which again protect your skin from damage by the sun and it also um, regulates the production of your skin to give you healthy skin cells. Omega-3 fatty acids, not only in fish, but in nuts and grains as well, protect the skin against sunburn and sun damage and help your skin to stay well hydrated, meaning enough of moisture in your skin. Okay, this is a question my patients always ask me. What supplement should I take? I always say nothing. Don't take supplements. Whatever you need, you get it from your diet. Modify your diet, don't pop pills. Supplements, are they safe? I'll show you. So when, um, when I was training a long time ago in, in hospital Kuala Lumpur, so we did a study and I think we, we worked with um, the Bureau of Pharmaceutical Malaysia, uh, so Herbat J's uh, department as well, and this, all these products which are supplements were analysed and you looked at what was in all these products. Mercury, which is a heavy metal, copper, lead, arsenic, chlorpheridamine, which is an antihistamine. This is what some of the supplements that you are taking and you think it's safe contain. This is again a very common uh, uh, supplement that um, patients, Chinese patients especially, take. And it has got, what does it have? It's got sulfur, it's got antibiotics, it's got painkillers in it. This one has got heavy metals in it, okay? So supplements, don't bother. Unless it's medically indicated, don't take supplements for your skin. Get your 
superfoods, I've shown you the superfoods like, you know, eat 10 per times a day, you don't have to take supplements, okay? Step two is, of course, what we talked about first is diet, second is plenty and plenty and plenty of water. Water is nourishment to your skin. You drink plenty of water, you won't get wrinkles. Exercise regularly. Again, it all goes down to healthy lifestyle. Alcohol reduction, don't smoke. And here, step four is to reduce sun exposure and practice sun protection. I have to stress this as a skin specialist. Living in Malaysia, we're exposed to very high um, index of ultraviolet radiation and the sun is at its peak between 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. We cannot help it, we do go out into the sun during these hours, but you must use a sunblock. Not just to protect your skin from aging, but to protect your skin from cancer as well and to keep your skin healthy. You must use a sunblock. If you don't like sunblocks, wear a hat, wear your sunglasses, use an umbrella. Try not to expose yourself to the sun between 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And a little note about sunblocks. Sunblocks only help your skin to stay protected for four hours. That's all. So a lot of times, what my patients tell me is, Doctor, I put on sunblock. I put on 7 o'clock in the morning when I go to work, I put on. I put on. Then I said, okay, you put on at 7 o'clock. By 11 o'clock, you're not protected. And what time is the sun at its peak? 11 o'clock. So I tell them, put it on in the morning. Lunch time before you go out for lunch, top up your sunblock. Evening before you drive home, top up your sunblock. Okay, it is very, very important. So the first message I want to let you take home is the superfoods for the skin. Second one is wear a sunblock. The entire family is wearing a sunblock now after becoming my patient. Okay. Reduce sun exposure like I told you because sun causes premature aging and skin cancer. So this again to show you the skin cancers. When you wash your face, again, this is something to understand as well. You only need to use warm water and a gentle soap. There is no need to wash your face with hot water and a very, very strong soap. A very mild soap will do. Twice a day, wash your skin and wash your face. And when you dry, use your towel and pat your skin. Don't rub your skin. Okay? A lot of times you see in the movies, people have a towel around them and they're rubbing their skin like that. That's not the way you're damaging your skin. Pat your skin dry after you have a shower. Moisturize, moisturize, moisturize. So that if you don't like to use anything on your skin, use a moisturizer and your sunblock and I'll be happy. That's all. The basics. Keep your skin healthy. And of course, learn to relax, sleep, do activities that calm you down, okay, because stress will show the, on your face the first place under your eye. You know that, right? When you don't have enough of sleep, when you're stressed, the first place to show it is the area under your eye. And visit your dermatologist. Okay, so now I have got one more section on menopause and beauty. Should I go on or should we stop here? You want to go on? Want interested to learn on how we can all look like Rekha when we are 70 years old, okay? Okay, so I think menopause is something very, very relevant to all of us women. So what are the changes that occur in menopause? So menopause is, uh, consists of perimenopause that's as you're approaching menopause, and then when you are experiencing menopause and then post-menopause, a lot of changes happen in your skin. Your menses become irregular, you may get hot flashes, redness of the skin, and you may even start to get pimples. That's why I said in your 40s you may experience pimples again, but once you pass the menopause, don't worry, you're not going to get pimples. Huh? And if you had previously normal skin, you'll say, why is my skin suddenly oily? Why is my skin suddenly dry? Because these are all due to the changes that are occurring as you're approaching menopause. And then, when you are going through the menopause, your skin becomes thinner, becomes dry, and again, this is something that is very common in Indian women, in Punjabi women, you may start to develop hair in this area. I don't know if any of you have experienced it, but it is very common, okay? And if you've had pigmentation issues before, they become more obvious during menopause and you find that your skin is sensitive also. So what should we do? We all want to look like this, at least I do when I'm 17. What should we do? Okay, 
So uh, take a photo of this slide. This is the basics. If you want to do something a little bit extra for your skin, then just applying the moisturizer and the sunblock. This is the basic thing you can do to maintain healthy, beautiful skin. Use a vitamin A containing cream. So when you're going to the beauty, beauty counter, you say, I don't know what cream to buy. Ask the, ask the assistant that I want something that has vitamin A. Vitamin A repairs your skin and stimulates the production of collagen. So buy a cream that contains vitamin A. No, and I don't, I'm not particular about what brand you use. Just use a cream that contains vitamin A. And then you ask, ask for a serum that contains peptides because peptides stimulate collagen production and also make your skin elastic so it doesn't sag. Then you want to use a rich moisturizer. When we say rich moisturizer, we want something that contains these ingredients, glycerin or hyaluronic acid. So now don't be confused when you go to the beauty counter. These are the products that you're looking for. A vitamin A containing cream, a peptide containing serum, and a moisturizer that contains glycerin and or hyaluronic acid, and of course sunblock. So this is the basic that you want to do. If you say, I want to do a little bit extra, then just apply the moisturizer and the sunblock. This is what you can do. Plus, minus, if you really, really want to do something extra for your skin, then you can come for chemical peels. They help to remove dead skin cells, make your skin look brighter. But you've done all this and you're still not happy. You want to do more, okay? And you would further like to improve your appearance. Then, of course, you want to go for big higher level anti-aging creams that have got vitamin A, Give me a minute, please. So we've done the basics, then we've done a little bit extra, but we're still not happy and we want to do a bit more. So you can use anti-aging creams. This would have anti-wrinkle ingredients like again vitamin A. You see I'm talking about vitamin A a lot. Alpha hydroxy acid and vitamin C. Vitamin C is useful when you apply it on your skin or you take it orally. There is no role of vitamin C injection. Has, have any of you heard of vitamin C injections? Okay, there is no role from a skin point of view for vitamin C injections. It is unethical to administer vitamin C injections. And it is not approved by Kementerian Kesehatan Malaysia but people are still doing it. I'm telling you, it, there is no role for vitamin C. You want to buy a cream that contains vitamin C, go ahead. You want to take vitamin C in your diet, please do. But do not go for vitamin C injection, okay? And there are other things that can be done, but this should be done by a qualified medical practitioner, either a dermatologist or a plastic surgeon. You can do skin rejuvenation, skin resurfacing, skin remodeling, and of course, plastic surgery. This is if you want to go all the way, okay? Which most of us do not want to do. So, just to show you a little bit of pigment laser, okay, the lady with pigmentation, and we treated it with laser and her, and her pigmentation has reduced. It has not gone away. There's nothing that can take away your pigmentation. It can only reduce it, okay? And wrinkles, again, okay, here with laser, nothing will make your wrinkles go away. Treatments can only reduce them. Resurfacing in a gentleman who had lots of tiny little moles. And of course, here we have botulinum toxin injection. After the injection, what happens? You cannot see the lady frowning anymore. Okay, all these lines have disappeared. This is again if you want to go, you want to go to that extent. You don't have to. This is for your information only. And then fillers. Fillers, what you do is you give injections into the areas here, and you can see a sagging looks much less. And the list goes on and on. The sky is the limit. If you want to spend your money, 
and end up looking like a former Prime Minister's wife, you can do that. But do you really want to do that? No. Okay, so sky is the limit, but we should always reach a middle ground, find a middle ground. This goes on and on. So in summary, I hope you've learned something from my talk today, and thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has any questions. That's a good question actually. Uh, the question was whether uh, facials help or not. Um, the answer is yes and no. Facials are nice, they are very feel good. When you go for a facial, you have your you know, you have your face cleansed and you put on a mask and a massage, it's a very feel-good factor. So the feel-good factor contributes to the, uh, your skin looking glowing and uh, healthy. However, when you talk about whether the facials benefit your skin long term, it could be yes and no. If you have problem skin to begin with, for example, if you have acne or you've got pigmentation issues, what some of the beauticians do is they will apply um, some sort of acne formulation, so they start pinching your acne, they do that. That is very, very bad, because that will leave you with permanent scars. So if you have problem skin to begin with, I would say go and get a professional opinion from a doctor, but if you have normal healthy skin, then by all means go for a facial. It's nice, it's, it's a nice thing to go for a facial. The skin good factor is that. So I hope I've answered your question. If they use chemicals, will it after 10 years cause cancer upon the people? Uh, the question was, that's a very good question also. If chemicals are used, will it cause cancer? The answer is yes. Uh, All right. However, having said that, not many of the facial preparations, uh, meaning the creams, lotions, etc., contain what we call carcinogenic chemicals. So um, it can occur, but it's very, very rare. Skin cancers are more contributed by um, sunlight for exposure to ultraviolet light and ingestion of substances that can cause cancer, not so much application. Yes? You mentioned can drug as a skin disease as well. Yes, it is. It's separate dermatitis, yes. That's a, good, a very good question because, um, yes, seborrheic dermatitis or dandruff is a common skin problem that many of us face. And like any skin problem, it has got varying degrees of severity. So if mild, moderate, severe. If you have mild dandruff, then your regular over-the-counter anti-dandruff shampoos can actually help. Because those anti-dandruff shampoos, they contain what we call ZPT, zinc pyrothionate. So, that does help in the um, treatment of mild and drug. But the trick is to use it properly. What people do is, they take the shampoo and rinse it off. <coughs> That's not going to help you. Why? Because what I shared with you is that dandruff is a skin problem. So if you take the anti dandruff shampoo, put it on your hair and wash it off, is it going to help? No, you have to massage it into your, the skin of your scalp because dandruff originates from the skin of your scalp, let it sit there for about 10 to 15 minutes and then you rinse it off. So you can do that with your regular over-the-counter anti-dandruff shampoo. Try it out. Everything that you try on your skin, you must try for 6 weeks to 3 months religiously before you say it's working or it's not working. So you do that. And if it doesn't help much after 3 months, then you can come for a professional opinion. Doctor, how about paraben in shampoos? Sorry? Paraben, is it P-A-R-A-B-N, parabens? Is it uh, good or not good? Parabens? Uh, poor parabens are actually getting bad publicity these days. Correct. Um, parabens are used in many, many um, ingredients uh, as a moisturizer and also as a preservative. To be very, very honest, in terms of research regarding parabens and skin diseases, there is not much scientific uh, research that says parabens are harmful. 
but it is a chemical. So nowadays, you know, people like to go this chemical-free, uh, natural products. So parabens are getting bad publicity for that. But to be frank with you, there's no scientific evidence to say they are bad. So if you can avoid them, avoid them, but don't be obsessed about avoiding them. That means don't, you know, you don't have to think, oh, does this have paraben or not, and be so obsessed about it. Because at the moment, there's no scientific evidence to back this up. All right, next question. Uh, school days, we learned that vitamin D, skin makes it, but in the morning. You're absolutely right. So, this is a very difficult balance to achieve when we are living in this country. I am telling you, use a sunblock, avoid the sun, and at the same time, I'm saying your skin makes vitamin D, right? So, you're right. Before 9 a.m., you want to sun yourself, go ahead. So, you, maybe you can follow what my father does. What he does is, he will sit in the porch, only his feet are in the sun, from 7.30 until 9 o'clock in the morning, while he's reading his newspapers. So, that is... The morning sun is very, very good for you. It's nourishing, it also, and you want to get your vitamin D to be produced, expose yourself to the morning sun, not to the sun between 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Okay, my next question. Please. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. You see, red meat, any kind of red meat, contains a lot of hormones. Okay, about the effect of red meat on the skin. That's a difficult question to answer, actually. Um, I would say red meat, per se, is not, a, is not a culprit when it comes to the skin. But nowadays, all our, our, most of our red meat, as you say, are adulterated with hormones and with growth factors and whatnot, antibiotics. Uh, antibiotics. So those are, those are the possible contributions towards the skin issues but not the red meat per se, because red meat actually is very high in iron, and that is good for your skin. But, you know, who can guarantee you the quality of the red meat that you're getting nowadays? That is more of the issue, not just with the red meat, to be honest with you, even with your poultry, chicken, fish, eggs, that is the issue, the, the fact that it's adulterated these days. My skin is not that dry and uh, it's sort of oily now and it doesn't have to be the olive oil and the heat in the skin. I think I showed you a slide on that. Lycopenols and carotenoids. Olive oil is rich in them. So that's probably what wonders for your skin. Yep, olive oil. Yes. Talking about olive oil. There is extra virgin, virgin, and then there's some yeah. she can cook, and some you can bake. So which yeah, is, I mean, some, you, there are some you can fry. But okay, I think this uh, this is beyond my level of expertise already. The different types of olive oil, but maybe have once at the comment. Yeah, you have you you have to look at the yeah. olive oil tin. It will tell you whether it's for cooking purposes because that means it has a high point a higher point for cooking. And then there are uh, virgin oils which are meant for salads, and that's not meant for cooking. So in my house, you'll find three different types of olive oil. So the, the ones that usually come in the tins, uh, and usually they're about three uh, kilograms or three liters, those are actually meant for cooking. But if you are just cooking it for a little while, huh? You want to put tarka and you want to use olive oil, that's fine, you can use any olive oil. But now we are talking about deep frying. When you are deep frying, you are bringing the temperature of the oil both garam ho janda. So if you are using oil that is not meant for deep frying, that oil will actually produce chemicals which are not safe for the body. And that includes for any oil. That's why you have to be very careful about what type of oils that you, you buy. You have to make sure that that oil can be used for deep frying. So we have different types of oils. It's a little bit daunting, but you can find a lot of this information on, on Mr. Google. 
you go in to type in Google and then you ask for the, the oils that are meant for frying, deep frying. Okay, but just for sorting for a little while, put tarka or something like that. But why you go for olive oil for tarka? Kyo is very, very good. Actually, kyo has come back to be something that's really good for us. So I, I put tarka with kyo and that's why I'm this big because I love the food. <laughs> I cannot comment on kyo and the skin. <laughs> that has a, that I cannot comment. I can tell you that olive oil is good, but yes, ghee is definitely making a comeback this year. Yes, please. My only concern about using oils as a moisturizer is are we really confident of whether the oil is really oil or not? That is the main issue. If you are making your own coconut oil, for example, at home, if you are making your own olive oil at home, then I will say, please, by all means, use that. That would be the best moisturizer. But because we are so uncertain these days of what is available in the markets as far as oils are concerned, I generally don't advise my patients to use oil as a moisturizer because unfortunately I've seen some of them get skin irritation and skin problems by using oil. However, if you are very sure of the quality of the oil, then please by all means do try it as a moisturizer. Please. Yes. Yes, the question is about virgin coconut oil and the skin health, hair health and general health. I would strongly encourage that if you are sure that your virgin coconut oil is, is actually real, pure virgin coconut oil, then I have no issues with it whatsoever. Of course, yes. Yes. Yes, by all means, when you are, if you are if you're confident enough that what you have purchased is of good quality and you have used it for about 5 to 7 days without any adverse effects, meaning reddening of the skin, itching of the skin or scaling of the skin, then we can safely say it's safe. So you have to give it a period of 3 to 5 days. Perhaps what we can do is use a small patch, a test patch. Any problems after three to five days, then you should be confident enough to use it everywhere else as well. No, please, please. Lovely actually has a chemical called hydroquinone in it. 
So usually what happens is um, hydroquinone does cause the skin to look fairer in the first three to six months on the, of, of using it. But after that, because it's uncontrolled usage and unmonitored, hydroquinone actually causes paradoxical darkening of the skin if used for longer than six months. So that is why when we use any of these uh, products, it should be under the supervision of a doctor. Yes, ah, hello. <laughs> sure, maybe we can pass you the mic so you can share our, your experience with it. That's why I have my line. Remember, coconut oil is a lorry oil. And when you, this, uh, there is a process of uh, molecularly distilling into monolaurin. Monolaurin is the most powerful germicidal known to man. In fact, mother's milk contains mononorin. So, the only problem with oils, whether they are vegetable oils or whether they are animal oils, is that oxidation factor. If you leave it too long or, you know, if you have... Uh, more oxidation comes in cooking rather than anything else, so, you know. Then you can get a little bit of acidity developing with production of free fatty acids, you, see, you know. Yeah, that can be it. But if you buy... Uh, virgin coconut oil that's perfectly fine, perfectly fine. In fact, remember, uh, historically, uh, the community, the Indian community, has been using uh, oil for synthesis of vitamin D and also for burns. Normally, you use coconut oil and it adds some charcoal to it and gives you burns. So, it's, it's a good oil. That's all I can say. <laughs> from, the, from the point of view of uh, what we call uh, Uh, your so-called smoothing of these things. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Any other questions? I have one question. Please. For skin with eczema problems, what sort of moisturizer do you use to keep it dry and moisturize? Okay. Fair. Very good question. Uh, so. Again, it depends on the, how severe the eczema is. When you look for a moisturizer to treat a skin with a problem like eczema, what you want, the first thing that you must make sure the characteristic of the moisturizer is that it is fragrance free. Alright, it is fragrance free and color free. And then, depending on how severe the eczema is, you want to think about whether you want to use either a lotion, a cream, or an ointment. What is a lotion? Can anybody tell me? A lotion is water-based. So, in something that's water-based, it's very easy to apply. You can apply it all over your body in half a sec, half a minute. But it doesn't stay for that long because it's water-based and water evaporates. So, you have to reapply it very often. Then you go to the other extreme, which is an ointment. An ointment is oil-based, extremely moisturizing, extremely thick, extremely oily. So it will take you a long time to apply. You will feel very oily, but it will stay on your skin. And in between is the cream, a balance of both. So it depends on how severe the eczema is. What I tell my patients who are very severe eczema is during the day you're very active, you're going around, you're doing this, that and the other. During the day you use a lotion or a cream. But when you're going to go to bed at night, apply an ointment. Because it will stick and it will moisturize you throughout the night. So if you're looking for um, characteristics of a moisturizer, make sure it is fragrance free and color free. And there are many brands available in pharmacies these days. I will just give you a few brands. Eucerin, Cetaphil, QV. These are all the skin grade, skin grade moisturizers available. Ceradan, UBOS. So any of this will do. It's important when you're choosing a moisturizer that you like it. You test it out, you like it. And that will make sure that you use it. Did I answer your question? I think there's one cream that has been used for a long time. They call it the uh, mix soda. <laughs> the magic cream that's supposed to help every single skin problem under the world. The green in the world. The mix soda. Yes. 
is that, is that a good thing to use? No. It's a jack of all trades, master of none. It's got antifungal, antiviral, antibacterial, and steroid in it. So you're banging everything without knowing what the problem is. And please don't. Please acid. don't. And salicylic acid as well. So please don't. Don't do that. You might cause more problems to your skin. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? I'm happy to answer whatever questions you have. What's the cause of hair fall? What sort of hair fall? There are many, many types of hair fall. More than 100 types of hair fall. So but which particular hair fall? The cause of it. Yeah, it all depends on which type of hair fall. There are many different types of hair fall, to be very honest with you. So I can't really answer that in a general way. But if we talk about um, hair fall as in what happens after pregnancy, you know, after pregnancy, there's, there's a type of hair fall we call telogen effluvium that occurs in up to 50% of mothers in the first three months after they give birth. That is due to the stress factor of giving birth. So the hair does fall. And if you, if, you talk to, if you talk about a hair fall after certain drugs, like chemotherapy, that is again the toxic effect of the drug to the hair follicle. Then you can also talk about the, uh, what we call male pattern hair loss. Male pattern hair loss is what occurs as we age. And it occurs, of course, more frequently in men than in women where they get thinning of the hair. So that is contributed by hormonal factors, by family history. So I can't really give you a general type of answer, it all depends on what type of hair loss and because there are so many types of hair loss, we actually need to assess the scalp, need to assess the hair before we can make a diagnosis of what type of hair loss it is and then appropriately we can uh, manage it. Sometimes even vitamin deficiencies can cause hair loss, like vitamin B, B complex for example, or even patients who have anemia. That means they have uh, low levels of iron in their body. That can also contribute to hair loss. So it's a very, very wide area to talk about. And it is a major concern also these days. Yes. Okay, that is actually a myth. This whole concept about detoxification, I think, is a is a, a a very very hot topic in the last maybe 10 to 20 years. You know, uh, maybe 50 years ago, nobody really talked about detoxification. So again, I have to stress that detoxification, the concept of detoxification, is for our feel good factor. You know, we feel we've undergone a detox, so we are we are healthier. You know, we've cleansed our body of everything that's impure, etc. But from a scientific point of view, I'm afraid there is no evidence to suggest any sort of detoxification helps skin or acne. Because acne is actually not due, it's, it's not due to toxins in your body or heat or eating the wrong type of food. Acne is a very complex skin issue and it's contributed by many, many factors. So in order to address acne completely, each of these factors has to be uh, addressed. So I have, to, I have to tell you that as far as scientific evidence is concerned, there's no role for detox. What are free radicals? Sorry, sir? Free radicals. What are free radicals? Free radicals are uh, ions that are produced in the environment that actually uh, harm not only our skin cells but any sort of skin, any sort of cells in our body because they interfere with the oxidation. So they interfere with the protection of the cell. So that is why we encourage you to take antioxidants. So antioxidants will protect you against these free radicals. Free radicals is not something we want. So uh, antioxidants are like vitamin A, C, E. So those are antioxidants which will help you, will help to protect you against free radicals. How, how, they, how is the action? Sorry? How did it affect? Action of the, the action of the free radicals is at a molecular level, again very very complex. It interferes with the with the pro, with the normal uh, reproduction of the cell. So the cells from normal cells they become abnormal cells, and when the cell is abnormal, it can cause problems. Inside or outside? Both. Cells. 
on the surface of the skin as well as inside your body. Any radicals and oxidation for they, they nowadays we can see in the market they have antioxidants. Yes, we because free radicals interfere with it, they cause oxidation. So we want the antioxidant effect. We encourage antioxidant intake because that protects you against free radicals. Free radicals is not something you want. You don't want free radicals. So that's why you take antioxidants to protect you against the free radicals. Have I answered your question? Confusing. You're confused. Okay, so all you have to remember is you don't want free radicals. Free radicals are all around us. We don't want them, so we want to take foods that are rich in antioxidants. A, C, E. Vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E will protect you against free radicals. In, in jungles, are there radicals? Sorry? In, in jungles. In a jungle, uh -huh. all greenery area, there is no pollution. Will somebody be affected by radicals? Are there free radicals in the jungle? Uh, uh, I because, can't quite answer that. I'm, I'm not, can you answer that for me? Can you help me out uh, here? Let me I'll simplify free radicals for yes, you. Yes, please. <laughs> Oxygen is O2. O2, yeah. O2. Uh, free radical is a single oxygen myoty that will attack your tissues. It's just like rust. Mm -hmm. Iron, you get rust, isn't it? Because of oxygen. Same mm -hmm. thing is happening. Single oxygen myotis that will, that will attack your body system if you know, those are the free radicals that you want to avoid. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about uh, whether we're covering these areas now. No, wait for a while. Why, why is this free radical and antioxidant thing is, is being highlighted nowadays? My question is, was it before, say, 200, 300 years ago, was this a problem or not? I think free radicals came into light when there was a defect in the ozone layer. Am I right? Because um, when, there was, when we talked about the ozone layer, the defect in the ozone layer, this was a hot topic maybe in the 90s, that the ozone layer was thinning and that was interfering with the protection from the atmosphere for ultraviolet C. Ultra, we have ultraviolet A, B and C. Nowadays we don't talk about ultraviolet C anymore because we don't have an issue with, with our ozone layer and ultraviolet C is not filtered down to our to Earth. So back when the ozone layer was an issue and ultraviolet C was reaching us, it caused the production of free radicals. It made O2 go into O. So instead of O2 oxygen, which we want, O2 went into O. And O was a free radical. Am I right? Correct, correct. Yes. <laughs> Also, it's more and more coming into prominence because of atmospheric pollution. This is man-made problems today. So, I think, I just wanted to ask you something. One is, of course, on acne. Uh, one of the products that has proven to be very good on acne is tea tree oil. They get tea tree oil. In fact, I used to manufacture tea tree oil in the former company. They brought the seeds from Australia and India. It's very, very effective. It's doing a lot of things. But coming back to microorganisms affecting man today. The biggest challenge is the, is the jumping of species from animals to humans now. Ebola, SARS, uh, you can talk Nipah, I think, one after the other. This is the biggest challenge man is facing. How are we going? Because particularly in countries like China, India, we are living very much closer to animals. This problem is the biggest. In fact, apart from climate change, my biggest worry is these epidemics of uh, microorganisms that have actually, they're not mutated, they're just that they have adapted themselves to human beings, you know. All the mutation also does take place, you know. So that is a very big challenge. That's true. I mean, if you're talking in terms of uh, skin issues, and uh, what you mentioned, Uncle, that, you know, we have these uh, uh, organisms that, that thrive on animals now affecting humans, we are actually seeing it these days as well. Uh, one of the, actually two of the common organisms we see nowadays in our practice, which wasn't there 10, 15 years ago, would be fungi. Certain fungus that exist on uh, dogs and cats that now can cause infections in children as well. And another fungus uh, by the name of uh, sporotrix, 
that uh, occurs in uh, is very common again in cats and dogs. Uh, cats more, but it's now affecting humans. So there's some mutation that's occurring around along the way that is actually causing humans to get infected with these organisms that that was not there then. Yes. In our diet, what do you recommend that uh, we eat so that we can have antibodies, so that we can protect our children and family from all those uh, you know, uh, skin diseases or whatever bacteria that's uh, transferring to the... Uh, I think that is, that's a question that is very, very difficult to answer because I don't think there's any superfood, so to speak, that can, can protect you and boost up your immune system and such. I think it again all goes back to uh, what I mentioned, a healthy balanced diet, adequate levels of vitamin A, sorry, vitamin C and vitamin E, leuco, uh, lycophenols and carotenoids in your diet. All this does contribute to a healthy immune system. These days, the, the hot topic is probiotics. I know you're going, you're going to ask me about that. Um, again, probiotics, theoretically, they are meant to be very good. I mean, if you read about probiotics as such, there's only good things that can, uh, most of the time, only good things that are said about them. But in real life, whether it translates to actual benefit, I have, I have, yet, to, I have yet to see. What we do encourage, based on a few papers now, the evidence is not strong, is that pregnant women and women who are breastfeeding should take plenty of probiotics in their diet. This minimizes, this is thought to minimize the chances of their children getting problems like eczema, asthma, rhinitis. Yes, perhaps there is some small amount of contributing evidence, but it's not concrete yet. So again, it all boils down to a well-balanced diet with sufficient amounts of vitamin C, E, lycophenols and carotenoids. Okay, back to the skin. Yes, young girls who are using all these home remedies, okay? It's like potatoes, yogurt, turmeric and all this to apply on the skin. Is this advisable for them to to do it? I mean, I mean, this is all from YouTube, right? it's not just like our yes, home yes, yes, yes. There's so many it's home remedies that are out there. So many home remedies. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Even, you know, my mom also, when we were younger, she put basin and lay on her face every Sunday. You put basin yeah. all over yourself, you know, so that so that your skin glows and whatnot. Uh, who's to say that this doesn't work? Certainly, as uh, people of medicine and people of science, I can't dispute that these things do not work. So I would say, by all means, you want to try a home remedy, go ahead and try it. If it works for you, it does it well and good. But the moment you develop any allergy or irritation, I think, please stop. Please stop. One thing I have to say is that the only thing I would discourage is the usage of apple cider vinegar. It is vinegar, it is acidic. So the potential that it can harm your skin is much more than the potential that it can benefit your skin. But if you want to use potato and, and dye and basin, and go ahead and use it. If it doesn't harm your skin, it makes you happy, it makes your mother happy, just go ahead and use it, no? <laughs> That's a different thing. That is, has got lots and lots of benefits. Drinking it is okay. Of course, you want to drink it as advice. You have to dilute it appropriately, etc. But to put acid on your skin is certainly something that I would not advise. Can I... Uh, I didn't get what you mean. You mean to say that apple cider vinegar and all that you can drink is okay? Or not on the skin, is it? I wouldn't advise it. I have seen people coming to see me with burns, etc. because they put apple cider vinegar on their skin after watching some video on YouTube. And then the poor skin doctor has to repair the damage. You know, so it's very challenging. Yeah, young girls don't, they don't yes, understand. they don't understand. They see whatever is there and they just include into their daily whatever they do. So they yes. apply it. Correct. They feel like it's just a swirly when you work on them. So it makes it up, you to explain to them as well. So yes, education. Correct. Yeah. I think uh, for me, last question. Sure. Okay. The skin on my hands are okay. Arms are okay. Face are okay. Neck are okay. But both feet always white. Or if you scratch the leg, you can see one white line. So why is it like that? Is it blood circulation or somebody? Or... Um, I don't think it actually depends on the location of the problem. But what you describe to me, when you scratch it, you see that it's white. That means there's absolutely no 
natural protection on that part of your skin anymore. That means you do not have the natural oils that exist on the skin anymore. So you have to moisturize, moisturize, moisturize regularly to protect that area. How about, how about both feet without scratching is white? Sorry? Both feet without scratching. Just like that, 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 it's too dry and white. Yeah. Why? Why do you do that? Okay, for that, you need to come to my clinic Monday morning at 9 o'clock so I have all my instruments, my tools to examine you and give you a diagnosis because I cannot answer it like this. Only Monday morning? Other Any morning you like, no problem sir. Okay, last question. I think we need to wait for the stop. Last question. Hello. Uh, hand, foot and mouth, the disease that you get the patches on your hand and the feet. Um, that again involving skin, right? And it get uh, only uh, those children below, I think, seven years old gets it, and to prevent it, and if you have it, uh, normally they will, uh, how to say, uh, uh, separate you, sort of like don't send it. Uh, because send it's highly it. infectious, it's caused by a virus and it's highly infectious. So, what you're talking about is hand, foot, and mouth disease. This is an extremely infectious uh, uh, viral infection in children and I uh, have to slightly correct you that it can also occur in adults. So we've seen adult hand, foot and mouth disease, it's much more severe in adults than it is in children. It's a fairly harmless problem in children, it's just extremely uncomfortable, can be a little bit painful. The child just has to go through it because it, it settles down without any treatment so to speak. You don't need to intervene and do a lot of things when, when the child has the problem. Uh, the issue is that what usually happens once the uh, virus has settled down and the infection is cured, is that your skin will be dry and it will flake off and it will peel. So during that time to maintain the skin health, you need to put on lots of moisturizer. But that's about all. There's really nothing to be too concerned about if a child gets head, foot and mouth disease. It's only an adult, it can be a bit more severe.